Hello, everyone. Welcome to Sit Heads Meditation Club. My name is John. I organize this group. Sit Heads is a sitting and social group for people interested in deep meditation practice. Everything we do is free and donation based. If you want to hang out with us, uh, you can find us at sit heads.com. So sometimes we have guest teachers join us. We have one such guest tonight. Um, this is George Haas. George, welcome. I'm so glad to have you here. Uh, I'm going to do a little introduction, if that's okay. Um, so, yep. All right, here it comes. Uh, George Haas has been practicing meditation uh, since 1992. Um, since 19, he began studying at Ordinary Dharma in uh, Venice, California. And then since 1998, he has been a student of meditation teacher Shinzen Young, uh, who we still study with today. He also studied in, uh, and I found this out by when, when he and I chatted, studied with a, a Burmese teacher named Saida U Indika um, in Myanmar, in Burma, a teacher of uh, metta and I believe also of Vipassana practice. I looked into him, he is interesting. He's a student of uh, Chan Miai Saidao, who was himself a student of the illustrious Mahasi Sayadaw. So, he, so they're within that lineage uh, of Vipassana practice. Um, he runs a, a pioneering and very popular online uh, Sangha, online meditation group called Metta Group. Um, he does a daily morning meditation. He takes one-on-one -on -one students. He teaches classes every week. He, um, and he does retreats as well. And then interestingly, he is also an artist and a photographer, right, George? Yep. With, uh, with works in the permanent collections of the Hammer Museum, the Library of Congress, the MoMA, uh, and the American Irish Historical Society. So this is a person who has done some stuff <laughs> in the world and outside of it. So I'm thrilled to have George here. He, he is here. I'm going to bring you up, George. George is here by request. So sit heads have asked that we bring George Haas in. So I could not uh, deny my beloved sit heads and hear <laughs> the man himself. I also hear your name brought up over and over again whenever I ask questions about Metta. People are always like, wet, wet, wet Metta versus dry Metta. Talk to George Haas. Wet Metta versus dry Metta. George Haas, George Haas. So I want to talk to you about that. Um, anyway, mm -hmm. this is George Haas. Here he is. He's here with us. Um, <laughs> if you find benefit from this session, I want to encourage you. So his website is in the chat. His website, for those of you watching the video after the fact, is metagroup.org, M-E-T-T-A, metagroup.org. And if you find uh, this session beneficial or enjoyable, I want to encourage you to offer uh, Donna to George and his group. George, is there anything that you want to say before you all have our conversation and then we move on to Q&A? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> but, and, and you meant it uh, all right cool so you and i if it's okay we'll have a short chat yeah uh, that helps sort of seed the q a and then we'll open it up uh to the broader group thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us today yep. happy to be here yeah really happy to have you so let's start with the old wet meta versus dry meta thing, which I, I often hear as sort of your, one of your sort of signature, I don't know, innovations in talking about the practice or describing it or, or taxonomizing it. And I we talked about this a little bit, you, you and I did. And I initially, so I, I laid out to you, I'm sure you remember this, but I laid out to you sort of two styles of meta instruction as I understood, uh, you know, I understood these two sort of distinct approaches, one of which I attributed to, it didn't come from her, but one I sort of associate with Sharon Salzberg mm -hmm. and one I associate with Ajahn Brahmalamso, um, the British born uh, Buddhist monk in the Thai forest tradition. And so Sharon talks a lot about, um, Recite the metta phrases. For anyone who doesn't know, metta is loving kindness practice. It's a practice of generating an attitude of well-wishing toward others, a wish for the happiness of others. Um, a powerful practice, an important one in, in Buddhist meditation. So 
Uh, Sharon talks about reciting the meta phrases, you know, the may you be happy, may you be peaceful, or whatever phrases you like or your tradition uses, um, and not really worrying about what you feel. Maybe you feel some warm feelings coming up, uh, maybe you don't. And what Sharon says is, don't worry about it. It's not your job to cook up those feelings. Just mean the phrases as you say them, and don't worry about it. And down the line, meta, the, the, the real meta will sort of emerge. And she'll tell stories about how she did an entire, you know, month-long meta retreat, didn't feel anything. And then sometime later, spontaneously, unexpectedly, she had this outpouring of meta. So there's Sharon. And then Ajahn Brahm talks about, he really says, no, 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 try and get that feeling going. That's, that should be sort of your goal. Um, imagine a cute kitten. Think about the kitten. If that doesn't get you feeling tender or warm feelings, imagine the kitten's looking at you with its big saucer-like eyes. Imagine that, it's, that it seems cold and alone and that you need to take care <laughs> of it. Do whatever it takes until you start to feel sort of like, ah. And then from there, keep visualizing, imagining to try and kindle and tend and grow that flame of metta inside. Um, do one of those resonate more with you than the other? And do those correspond to dry metta versus wet metta? Or is, or is that a different sort of split? Or, or do you see things a, a different way? Um, you know, uh, this the phraseology of dry versus wet comes from Vipassana practice. Mm. Dry Vipassana practice is a Vipassana practice that has no concentration uh, orientation. And wet uh, Vipassana practice is a practice where you begin with concentration. And once you're able to get into a high concentration state, then you switch to uh, Vipassana. And so it's it kind of flipped in the on the meta side of things. Um, most of the time, uh, when people are teaching uh, Sharon's approach, it's a mantra-based practice where you're repeating the, the phrase. And the phrases themselves are supposed to be the link into uh, coming into the meta mind. Um, in wet uh, metta, the end goal is this emotional state that is uh, a meta emotional state. Mm. And in dry uh, metta, you're attempting to come into a high concentration state. So that's the main difference. What we're really looking for is a high concentration state, not the generation of a feeling state through the repetition of phrases. So in the, so in the sort of uh, dry style, yeah. um, whether or not you feel warm, loving feelings is it sounds like you're saying it's essentially irrelevant. It's incidental if it happens. Is that is that correct? Well, what we're attempting to go for is a concentration on the the mind state or the view of metta, and then to view whatever emotional experience arises through that filter. Mm -hmm. I, I, so a mind state rather than a feeling. That's a distinction we're drawing here. Right. Okay. So rather than a body-oriented uh, sensation that, that has uh, a meta quality to it, we're looking for uh, concentration on a view or a mind state. Okay. Um, is it okay if we unpack that a little bit more? Because I find yeah, this totally. fascinating, and I, I only partially or even dimly or maybe barely understand the distinction. And so I would love to, to keep looking at this. I think it's so fascinating. You don't usually hear people talk about meta this way. So... I naturally wanted to make a beeline uh, for this topic with you. So, like for instance, I have this new puppy. Right. And when I look at this puppy, assuming that it's not, you know, gnawing on my forearm in that moment, um, what I feel for it or, or my, my whole orientation toward it, it feels both mental and physical. There is a warmth, um, right? And there's like a relaxation in the body. Um, there you know, if it's strong enough, you almost want to cry. And there's also this, there's also this orientation that isn't pure feeling. It isn't pure physicality. In other words, right. it's not purely somatic. There's also this feeling of, yeah, wanting the very best for this being, wanting to protect this being from harm, um, wanting to see this being flourish. And the two feel all mixed and muddled together, which I think is how emotions often are, right? They're this blend of cognitive, and affective. And could I ask you, what view are you holding as you do that? 
well, I wonder what you mean by that. What view well, of it? Is the mind uh, equanimous and without a view? Is the mind inclined toward uh, uh, happiness or joy? Uh, is the mind, uh, maybe the puppy chews something up and then the mind is angry. Uh, totally. What view are you holding? It is definitely a puppy induced mind state. It is not, uh, it is not generated from my own, my own profound awakening. You know, right. it is, it is a, the, the same way that attention can be generated by an interesting TV show, right? No great feat of attention. This is no great feat of meta, right? This is just a cute puppy. So it, it pulls right. it out of me, but there is an inclination. So to then if you break that down even further, why is your conditioned response to the experience of the puppy pleasant? And could you imagine somebody who's conditioning toward a, the experience of a pump puppy would be unpleasant or neutral? Why is it pleasant? Yeah. Um, I don't know. It just is. The sensation is pleasant. The attitude of well-wishing itself feels pleasant. It, um, I mean, if I had to think about it a little bit, maybe this is more analytical than introspective, but a lot of it is because I can't think about my own dumb problems when I'm busy focusing on how adorable this being is. It does sort of cut at self in a sense. Um, so then if we break it down even further into the, the nature of uh, ultimate reality versus conceptual reality, you have the capacity to sense things, including mind, which focuses on the puppy. You take in the sense data through the five senses. You evaluate them for threat. Uh, if there's no threat and there are pleasant sensations, it actually will go through a process of arising in consciousness. Uh, the sensations themselves are compared to the perceptual database of previously experienced things. And if there are entries in there that match closely enough to the sensing experience that you're currently having, conceptual reality arises and between ultimate reality and conceptual reality is where the view goes. So ultimate reality is then filtered through the mind state or the view that you're holding and it infuses the creation of conceptual reality with the particular mind state that you're holding at that moment. And what you're describing right now, am I right in understanding that this does relate to this, to dry meta? Because you're talking about view here and you mentioned right. that dry meta is about the view of meta. So, so, th that, so that's right. So, okay, so it sounds like, this reminds me to draw like a little bit of an analogy. It reminds me a little bit of, about when Tibetans talk about bodhicitta because right. there is a relative bodhicitta, which which you could more or less understand as um, a sort of compassion, a wish to become enlightened out of compassion for other beings, right? So mm -hmm. it's very like, it, it, it's very much based in the, uh, uh, a straightforward and understandable conception of compassion as, we, as most people understand it, a wish to serve others. That's the relative bodhicitta. And then they talk about ultimate bodhicitta, which is not, so limited and really is just the view of enlightenment itself in some sense and transcends things like, you know, there is a, a natural outpouring of compassion, but I always was struck by how different relative bodhicitta and ultimate bodhicitta are. Relative bodhicitta is like, yeah, wish to serve beings, wish to become enlightened for their sake. Ultimate bodhicitta is just the sort of non-dual uh, selfless state of, you know, the na of uh, self-recognizing wakefulness. And I feel like there's a similar thing happening here where it's like we're talking about metta, which I normally think of as kind-heartedness, tenderness, uh, well-wishing. And then you're saying the view of metta, but you're not talking about, I don't hear you talking about well-wishing at all. You're really just talking about well, understanding the nature of reality. Yes, but understanding, I haven't talked about what the view of metta is, just okay. the mechanics of a view and how to identify them. And there are many views that you could hold, including the enlightened view. Can you imagine how useful it would be to you as a practice to develop a great dexterity with views so that when the enlightened view arose, you could recognize it and then also foster it to hold it continuously, which would be one way to describe enlightenment. But here, what we're really just talking about is that there are many different kinds of views and that you can develop agency to cause the view that you want to arise and maintain it, and that you can recognize in the way that it distorts conceptual reality, which view you're holding. So 
it's one of the ways that we really sort of reverse engineer our uh, experience of conceptual reality to understand what the view is. So this the, the, really the practice, and this is a meta vipassana practice, which is you know set in the Theravada tradition, not in the Tibetan tradition, of yeah. exploring uh, what view you're holding, which you do through uh, this combination of metta vipassana, where the when you need to understand what view you're holding and the mechanics of it, you're really on the vipassana side. But once you understand what a view is and what the metta view is, and you can cause it to arise and sustain awareness of it, it then becomes an object for high concentration states. So not to come back to this, but Sharon style practice, right. would you call that dry or wet or neither? I would call it wet. Wet. Okay. This is really useful, by the way, because I've described this little personal taxonomy in the past, sort of Sharon versus Brahm, and people invariably respond, oh, you're just, they invariably say, you're describing wet versus dry meta. You should talk to George Haas. Right. But here I am talking to you, and you're actually saying that's not so. Well, the reason for that is that, she, that uh, it, hers, in the way that you describe it, and I understand it probably a little differently than you do, uh, is... Okay a uh, mantra-based practice. Uh, and uh, what we're looking for in that kind of practice, and I'm not saying that one practice is better than another or that you should do one practice or another. Um, it really uh, goes to what is the purpose of your practice and, and what, what are you hoping to get out of practicing in the way that you are practicing? Because we tend to have the results of practice be the practice that you're doing. And there's a wide range of results that you could have. Um, <clears throat> she's attempting to generate this pleasant state of metta, which actually is available mainly when you're generating the phrases and not beyond that. That's that particular practice. In the, the practice of maintaining views, you could put the meta view up and if you could sustain it all day long, you could just operate in the world of the meta view without actually generating phrases. Uh, and this is okay. this is the dry meta right. that you're referring to now. And how yeah. does one practice it so it doesn't involve the phrases? Um, the phrases in, in dry practice are uh, really uh, concise and restricted because you don't want to divide your concentration by holding more than uh, one object or holding minimally um, objects that are different than the mind state itself. Um, when you look at the internal experience of this, of course, you're uh, in the traditional practice radiating it out to somebody in particular, and uh, they receive it and it's reflected back. So in uh, the traditional way of practicing, it would be somebody who's alive that you know that you can target and send the metta to, and then it's reflected back to you. And that opens the possibility of a high concentration state. Um, and we're still talking about the Salzburgian style. No, this is the dry meta style. Okay, all right. Sorry, I'm glad I asked. All right. Then what you do is cause the mind state of um, loving kindness to arise. So Sayadaw would say that it's always cool, that there's an absence of the heat of moha or, or craving for worldly satisfaction. There's an absence of the heat of loba, which is an anger that results from the frustrated desire for uh, worldly things. Um, so an absence of heat. I like to, if you were using the, the descriptions that my family used that I grew up understanding, then it would be a kind, open-hearted, friendly curiosity. But uh, curiosity in my family was a kind of inclining or investigative uh, quality to it rather than something that has any heat. Mm -hmm. uh, and understand that when that view is present, uh, it changes the way that you perceive conceptual reality. So we're really uh, exploring backwards. Now maybe we're flipping into the Vipassana side of exploring how we create conceptual reality, uh, coming back and touching into ultimate reality, this process back and forth. The Pali word is Taja Tajanapanti. Um, the constant back and forth of comparing conceptual reality to ultimate reality to understand what view or absence of view is there. So you're using uh, the metta practice to uh, 
understand the nature of view to develop agency in causing one particular view over another to arise and then being able to sustain the view mm -hmm. and then exploring the nature of conceptual reality through holding a particular view. What you'll notice, though, is that the, the bliss states that we typically associate with concentration states begin to apply to meta states, so that you'll be in a high concentrated meta state, and then the, the blissfulness that arises from holding a high concentration state will amplify the, the quality of the meta. Mm. So if you like strong meta states, the, the dry uh, practice will, uh, in the end, produce much uh, stronger states. Hmm. Yeah, despite it being, as you said, having a, having a, a felt sense that is cool rather right. than warm or, or, or sunny or something like that. It doesn't, it doesn't sound like that's the vibe. Right. Okay, interesting. And so would I be right in, in understanding that this is something of a rare, at least in the States, something of a rare approach to Metta. Because I do feel like the Sharon and Brahm approaches tend to dominate, partly because of how prominent Sharon is and how, how critical she was in the sort of dissemination of Metta teachings in the West. And, right. and she also came, like she learned her Metta practice, I believe, from Sayadaw Upandita. Um, Right. And so it sounds like this is a different lineage, in a sense, of meta teachings that 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 is maybe not as well known and not as widely available. Would you say that's right or am I overstating things? No, I think that's correct. It, this is uh, no Mahasi did teach meta vipassana as an integrated practice, but he didn't teach it as a general practice. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the origin of vipassana practice in the West, it really came over without meta. And metta was an add-on to it. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of people who do vipassana practice don't resonate very well with, with metta practice. Uh, and so it really has, in in the main uh, vipassana communities, always been a, a secondary or add-on practice. Mm -hmm. In the metta vipassana practice, since it's an integrated practice, it's always a part of it. And actually, you develop the metta aspect first so that you have a uh, intentional positive uh, a capacity for intentionally positive states that you can use as a refuge so that when you explore on the vipassana side if it gets too hot you have a place that you can come cool off mm -hmm. uh, and so that it's that it has always been uh, taught in, in this regard as a back and forth practice interesting and that is distinct i remember when we had sharon join us she you know, she talked about metta as essentially a corrective. She said it wasn't something that you that everyone needs to practice necessarily. It's something that you practice if she talked about how mindfulness should have a quality that is gentle, that is appreciative, that isn't harsh or self-critical. And that if you find it getting too sharp edged, you do metta to round it out a little bit. But right. that not everyone needs to do it. And when asked if it could be a practice, a, a practice that leads to awakening in and of itself, she said that she she hasn't typically seen it that way. As it's own, and it sounds like what you're describing is a meta centric practice that is actually a practice aimed toward awakening. Is that right? Well, I would say it's balanced rather than mm. centered on one. Meta vipassana is an integrated practice, so it's the meta vipassana approach to practice, which does uh, lead to enlightenment. Is there, since this is a lesser, uh, a less widely known, less widely taught style of metta practice, is there a text or anything, any like sort of recorded or documented instruction, either from you or from someone else or from, or from Saidao, uh, uh, yeah, side out Indica has a, a book that's been translated into English that you can get. It's a PDF that's freely distributed. Okay. What's it called? Um, Do you know? Meta, baby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Straight to the point. Uh, it, it should, if you, if you Google, uh, I'm going to pull it up right now and we'll find out. Um, yep. It is called 
Metta, <laughs> the practice of loving kindness as the foundation of insight meditation practice, but right. as the foundation for insight meditation practice. So right. there's that integration that you're talking about that you really, you're, you're quite right. You don't really often see it presented that way. It is presented as a thing, you know, you're always admonished not to neglect it or to, right. or to underestimate its importance, but it is nonetheless presented as a condiment Right. To keep on the side, you know, to sort of dip your practice in once in a while. Um, so we, we do a lot of attachment work in, in, at Metagroup. And um, one of the things about people that need to do attachment work is that they had crappy childhoods. And one of the things about crappy childhoods is that, that, that people have a lot of pain that they hold. And so one of the difficulties of going directly into a Vipassana practice is it tends to amplify the distress that people are in. Mm -hmm. The typical approach to working with that is to stop meditating. And yeah, bad so that, that makes it slow. Uh, and so when you begin by uh, creating a refuge of intentional positivity, not with the idea of bypassing the difficulties that would be uh, arising with the Vipassana practice, but as the foundation uh, and, and they're reliable, then you can go into the Vipassana side of practice. And uh, I like to say not so much fearless, but with equanimity, with terror, as you go into the painful places. And then if they heat up too much, you have confidence that you can withdraw into an intentional positive state. Mm. hold the experience until it cools down yeah. and then zoom right back into the Vipassana side. Mm -hmm. Also, if you develop the capacity for high concentration on positive states, you can flip that capacity for high concentration onto the Vipassana side yeah. and then enter into Vipassana practice in a, in a jhanic state, which uh, in Theravada practice at least is considered a good idea. Yeah. And this is the downside that you're pointing to of sort of dry vipassana in general, right? I mean, concentration might have not exactly the same, but also a salutary effect, uh, providing more of a refuge from the, the, the more hair-raising stages of vipassana practice. And it's really, it's the Mahasi method. And look, I'm a practitioner of the Mahasi method, so right. no disrespect, you know, all But praise. both of these are Mahasi. Sure, touche, but, <laughs> but you're right. But when I say the Mahasi method, I mean that sort of dry Vipassana. Right. Show up on retreat, don't do Samatha, don't do sort of breath-oriented concentration practice, but just do your Vipassana from the start. That's, that's the practice that um, is streamlined and leads towards stream entry, et cetera, but can be a bumpy ride without concentration, and without also method understand that mainly the way that uh, Vipassana was taught in the West is in retreat settings. Yes. You don't need to necessarily develop concentration because being on retreat develops the concentration. But when you're not going on retreats, you're really uh, meditating uh, as a householder in community meditation centers. What I noticed when I was teaching it against the stream was that people didn't have enough concentration to have an effective Vipassana practice. Yep. And with, without an intentional development of concentration, mainly Vipassana was a frustrating experience because they couldn't get the meditative experiences that were being described because they couldn't hold the objects long enough. I think that's dead on. I think that I think that the Mahasi style, the Mahasi style of dry Vipassana depends on the retreat environment. Right. That's my sense. Um, and it is, you know, they say it builds enough concentration in and of itself to, to sort of fulfill the requirement of right concentration. But, but I think you're right that it is leaning fairly heavily on the absence of adventitious circumstances. Right. Right? It's leaning on the, the beautiful retreat conditions where you're relatively free of external distractions and so forth. I think that's, uh, it's really worth mentioning and, and should be talked about more. Um, not enough people are talking about this, as they say, uh, as they say on Twitter. Um, briefly, uh, before we open up the Q and A, I want to I want to circle back to you mentioned the, the sort of attachment repair right. work that you do, and I know that's an important component of your teaching. And you actually mentioned to me that you look at. Um, attachment repair is essentially a nundro 
for Westerners. Uh, Nundro, for anyone who doesn't know, is the Tibetan term uh, for preliminary practices. In Tibetan Buddhism, before they introduce you to deeper practices, or they're supposed to at least, before they introduce you to tantric practice or Dzogchen or Mahamudra, they, uh, you, are, you are asked to complete a series of preliminary practices designed to sort of cultivate your mind, your heart, and prepare you to receive those teachings. And you, George, mentioned that you see attachment repair work as those preliminary practices um, that, that for many Westerners need to precede waking up practice. Um, could you talk about that a little bit? Well, what I notice in, in the meditation communities is that we have a sort of bell curve of functioning. We have the one end, which is very low functioning people, and they're really sort of trying to get it together so they can get into the competition of our society. And then you have the other end of the curve, people who easily achieve goals in our system and and uh, often find themselves still unhappy uh, mm. that come in. Um, attachment disturbances uh, cause a lot of suffering. And so people, and also uh, on the disorganized end of it, cause a lot of dysfunction or inability to really show up and, and, and uh, live much of a fulfilling life. And um, because the Western strategies that we have don't really do much around attachment repair, uh, or at least they haven't so far, um, a lot of, of those people end up in spiritual communities looking for meditation to provide that uh, way either out uh, of the dysfunction into something better or to find meaning in a life that uh, where the typical societal goals are easily satisfied but not rewarding. And so you see them as skipping a step, essentially. So I find that neither one of those groups, if there's underlying attachment disturbances, can uh, uh, fulfill the, the promise of the practice very well. Can you briefly elaborate on what attachment disturbance is for, for people who, who happen not to have encountered that idea? All right. Attachment theory was, uh, was formulated by John Bowlby uh, in um, the UK. Um, he collaborated with an American named Mary Ainsworth, and they devised a, a, uh, an understanding of the way that the um, infant caregiver uh, relationship formed essentially a view of self and world that's very stable. In fact, mm -hmm. you have an 85% chance of having the same attachment orientation as your primary caregiver had. And do you have a functioning uh, attachment view or system at about 10 months old and 70% of people use that, that orientation throughout their entire life? So that if you have a, a, a chaotic household and you develop uh, attachment issues, you're li likely to carry them with you throughout your whole life and they'll have a, a, a profound impact on, on how it goes for you and your level of satisfaction. We talk about securely functioning people. We talk about um, dismissing, these are adult categories, a dismissing person who's very uh, cut off from emotions and limited in their ability to form significant attachment relationships. We talk about preoccupied people who don't explore very well and, and are very uh, sort of enmeshed with uh, their, in their uh, attachment relationships. And we talk about disorganized people who are very fearful about uh, the, the nature of life. Um, to pursue a, a deep practice uh, and to pursue enlightenment means that you have to organize your life in such a way that you have the time, energy, and resources to devote to that practice as are needed. And what you find in people with uh, pronounced attachment disturbances is they can't get that together in order to provide for themselves the environment where they would be able to pursue uh, a deeper practice. Um, and so what uh, we, well, I mean, I think in my experience, you need to have a, a sort of stable environment where you can over a period of time, uh, pursue the goal of that. Uh, and that means you have to have a place to stay, you have to have things to eat, you have to be able to survive in, uh, mainly as a householder in our culture. We don't really have much of a, monastic community in the West. The monastic community in the West is also largely people don't function very well in society, whereas in Asia, it's a, a whole 
vehicle of, of life because it's, a, it's such a dominant part of those cultures, whereas it's really mainly a, a small a side venture here. Mm -hmm. So when you come into practice, if there's a lot of uh, what we would say in Western psychological issues that arise that prevent you from being able to sustain a practice over time so that you can go deep, it would be make more sense to practice in a way that relieved those uh, issues so that they were actually settled and out of the way. So then you were then free to pursue deep practice. But if you could do it in such a way that all of the skill that you needed to develop in order to be able to pursue your deep practice was the skills that you were using to relieve the psychological problems, then you're in some sense um, um, tackling two issues at the same time. Yeah. You're learning the preliminary practices that you need to pursue enlightenment and at the same time resolving the difficulties that you have that prevent you from having a deep practice. That's why we think of it as a preliminary practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, similar to how in the Tibetan Nundro, you're developing concentration in the course of doing those, those you are, while you're also sort of clearing out your karmic obscurations and purifying right. yourself, you are also, they're, they're sort of smuggling in the, <laughs> the core skills. And so how is it that attachment repair work builds that meditative or that dharmic skill set while you're doing it? Well, part of it is the view, and that's why we like the metajana to really establish views. What you need, uh, as I said earlier, to understand enlightenment is to understand what an enlightened view is. Then you need to be able to cause the view to arise. Then you need to be able to sustain it. Once you're in a place where you can easily sustain an enlightened view, you could be said to be enlightened. If you know what a view is, and, you, uh, and uh, you're going to have to learn what a view is. Now, you may have had a situation in childhood where your caregivers taught you to understand what views are. This is a common thing that would happen. Did you have a parent that says, I can't figure out what's going on with you. What's going on with you? Use your words. What are you talking about? I'm not understanding how you arrived at this decision that you just made. Can you explain it to me? All of those questions in childhood uh, cause a child to self-reflect, understand their motivations, understand what they were thinking and feeling in that moment. And that's actually the education uh, that you would need to have uh, a good understanding of you. So secure people have that already. They don't need to do that. They could go on to a deep practice if they have all of that understanding. But people who are insecurely attached or disorganized didn't have that training when they were children and they so you would have to do it now mm. do you have good skills for emotional regulation if you don't have good skills for emotional regulation then when you get into a frightening place or a difficult place uh, in the practice you're not going to be able to sustain awareness of it because your emotions are going to pull you out of it so then you have to learn emotional regulation skills um, you need to have uh, the capacity to be in dialogue with people in an intimate way so that they know what's going on with you so that you can describe the experiences that you're having in meditation to somebody who can then understand them and then help direct you in the right way. There's a lot of insights that come up. Only some of them are oriented toward deep practice and enlightenment. How do you tell the difference? If you can sustain an intimate relationship with somebody that you can have that level of dialogue, you won't get the help that you need to be able to pursue it in an efficient way. All of those things are really in this um, place of attachment and intimate personal relationships and a skill set that you're going to need to be able to to track that. I know many of us come to practice and we really want to just be in a cave alone, uh, seeking enlightenment, <laughs> but that's what we would call a dismissing attachment strategy. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. Someone, someone should have, unfortunately, unfortunately attachment theory wasn't around to intervene with you know, Milarepa before he went up the side of a mountain and decades in eating uh, nettles in a cave. Right, somewhere. exactly. Someone could have given him a, a proper set of clothing. Um, but uh, this is this is fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to, I want to move to the Q&A because I'm sure other people have questions that they want to, uh, you know, there are plenty of, of opportunities for them to build on this. Yeah. One last question from me briefly, and then we'll, we'll keep going. Would you say that in addition to attachment repair, 
as a general matter, sort of uh, more contemporary psychological uh, work, you know, psychotherapeutic work is also of the nature of Nundro, would you would you see that as useful for practice or or antithetical to practice or because um, you you know you're talking about attachment repair in general, but it sounds like you're kind of broadly saying that if you don't have your you know what together, you kind of can't do this stuff. And so would you say that that sort of psychological integration work and cleanup work through things like psychotherapy is harmonious or at times even necessary for someone to go deep with their meditation? Um. Well, we're, we're ju we just focus on attachment mainly. Um, if you're securely attached, uh, and you know, a large section of the population is securely attached, depending on who you read, um, say from say 32% uh, up to say 65%, depending on the, the group. Um, you pro you don't need to do most of this uh, uh, preliminary practice. You're you're already able to do the things that I'm describing, mm -hmm. and that if you have some psychological issues that come up in that, which uh, which can happen, uh, psychotherapy is really useful for that. But if you don't have that very basic level down, psychotherapy hasn't proven to be that helpful for it. Mm -hmm. So that's why we, we have a particular focus on the attachment stuff. Interesting. All it right, is well, also, that... our approach is also meditation-based and not therapy-based. Mm -hmm. And that's another uh, difference, I think, than adding on psychotherapy. This, this is an integrated approach. Even the attachment repair work, in other words, is still meditation-centric, you're saying? Yeah, mm -hmm. we use I meditation, see. not uh, therapy to repair it. Understood, not talk therapy. Yeah. Right. Got it. Um, well, this is fascinating. I could do this all day. Uh, I'm not going to do this all day. Instead, <laughs> I'm going to open it up uh, to the group to do Q&A. That was a really rich and wonderful uh, conversation. Uh, thank you. I'm, not because of me, because of you. Thank you very much uh, for that, yeah. George. And um, so let's, uh, let's move to Q&A. Is that all right with you, George? Yeah, totally fine. Terrific. So here's the first question, George. Do you need a good enough attachment style to meditate? I have complex attachment style and find meditation excruciating. Um, well, I think that anybody can meditate. The question then is what practice are you doing? And is it aggravating to uh, the difficulties you experience or is it beneficial? It's always this reflection. So what would be useful to do is to talk to somebody and arrive at a practice that you could try to see whether or not it would be soothing. Does this apply to the Vipassana side or to the Metta side or both sides? Um, you know, it really depends on um, uh, uh, what's happening. Does it, do you have the same issue in a group meditation that you have in an individual meditation? Do you have the same issue in a guided meditation that you have in uh, pra practice without guidance. There's so many factors, it's, it would be hard to, to know without uh, having a conversation about it. Got it. Thanks, George. By the way, do you, are you still taking one-on-one -on -one students or are you, on that note or are you full up? No, I, I you know, uh, Nietzsche, everything's impermanent. So, uh, <laughs> Uh, sometimes the scheduling is difficult because of the time that's open, but usually something is happening. We do uh, three or four courses a year, and uh, you know, the attachment work is not meant to go on forever. In fact, we would like you to get through it as quickly as you can. Um, you know, sort of the 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 longest would be about two years or so. Uh, of doing the work to get to a place where you, you can earn security. Uh, really, it's, it's not so much the length of time, but the number of sessions that you're able to do during the period of time. Mm -hmm. I see. Um, All right, well, thanks. Um, and thank you on behalf of the person who asked that question. Uh, next up, Stephen. Stephen, would you like to ask your question? 
Sure, yeah. Hi, George. Thanks Hi. for coming tonight. I've uh, been highly recommended by uh, from my friend Philip, who's here tonight as well. And I was wondering if you could elaborate more on something you said earlier about Meta being the holding of the view, and if you could hold the view of an enlightened state, say Meta, then that's you know that's what you're going for. I was wondering if you could speak to like practices that take view as an object and identify and discern like different views and maintain views. Like, how do you work on cultivating those from states or? temporary views into traits? Well, in the Brahma Viharas, which is the whole collection uh, on the on the metta side, um, you um, understand what the loving kindness view is, what the compassion view is, what the uh, sympathetic joy view is, and what the uh, uh, equanimous view are. On the Vipassana side, uh, the Buddha talked about um, the equanimous mind, you use the metaphor of a, a, a bowl of water as a mirror. We don't experience things directly, we experience them through the mind. So is the mind equanimous? It's as if the bowl of water were still and clear. Is the mind filled with craving, which would be the, the, the water were dyed a bright color, so the reflection off the surface infuses in the view the, the bright color. You notice how lust or craving tends to uh, create this uh, effect um, is the mind filled with um, hatred or anger it's as if the water were boiling if, uh, is the mind filled with restlessness or agitation it's as if a breeze were blowing across the surface of the bowl is the mind filled with sloth and torpor as if with an algae growing over the surface is the mind filled with skeptical doubt uh, that would be the water is muddied but can you recognize when the mind is angry, when the mind is sad, when the mind is fearful, and all of these things create a distortion in the way that conceptual reality appears? We then, when we add the, the meta views, can you understand when meta mind is there, or loving kindness mind, when karuna mind is there, or compassion mind? And can you understand when your attachment mechanism goes off, how it distorts the perception of uh, conceptual reality if you can't understand that what we mostly do is see the creation of conceptual reality that we made as true and then we formulate the intention and action that we take in response to that based on our understanding of conceptual reality being an accurate representation and then that creates the karmic threads that either are beneficial or afflictive often uh, when we are accepting a distorted view an afflictively distorted view as the way things are we take actions which are uh, distressing uh, to other people or to the situation that we're in have you ever misunderstood something and, and responded from the place of misunderstanding only to realize later that that you were uh, in a distorted mind state and that that uh, uh, created an action that was not appropriate to the situation. So really, uh, you could come at this from any aspect of practice that you wanted to. Uh, um, the Vipassana side is really, is the mind equanimous or are the hindrances present? So there's that investigation there. And on the metta side, is, can you understand how uh, uh, the holding of the view distorts in a beneficial way the the a reality that you experience consciously. Is that all making sense? Am I answering your question? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Thank you. I think I understand what you're talking about. Good. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks, George. Next up, we have Eve. Eve, would you like to um, come up and ask your question? Yes, thank you. All right. Hi, George. Thanks for coming tonight. Yeah. Happy um, to be here. Yeah, good. Uh, I really like the attachment repair work, too. Like, I found that very interesting. And um, one thing that I was wondering, and I guess this is sort of like a, uh, maybe like a, a guess of my own, but it, I would love to hear you talk about this, if, there, if you have any thoughts on it. Um, 
because I had some disorganized attachment and then I felt like any kind of work on no self was not a good idea for me. Right. Um, and then, but as my attachment has become more secure over time, then that feels more approachable. Like that kind of work, the no self stuff feels more approachable for me. So I wondered if you had any thoughts on that. So uh, in the, the formulation of enlightenment that Theravada uses, it's an anatta nietzsche and dukkha, so not self uh, impermanence and then the understanding of suffering or unsatisfactoriness or reactivity. Um, the um, all of the the practices that you do um, result in the insights that you have. So that if you find that you're doing a particular practice and it's creating uh, an, an outcome that isn't useful, you should stop it no matter what area of practice that it, it, it's in. It, that isn't uh, helpful. Um, what about the um, experience of no self is the issue? So then uh, we're talking about really in some way the, the way that you hold the experience of self um and do you have a strong uh, sense of self or is the sense of self um uh, not particularly developed do you have a, a sense of self that's largely afflictive so that when you bring your attention uh, to the self experience does that in, in aggravate the the distress about that um and then um how do you know the sense of self? So you have auditory thinking, you have visual thinking, you have emotion in the body, which creates the sense of self, depending if we relate it to attachment, whether that organization is around yourself or around someone else. What often happens to, to people who are oriented around other people uh, in terms of maintaining a, a sense of self, the disconnection from other people is actually the thing that's distressing. Uh, and so it creates a depersonalized state, which is distressing. It's, so um, it's, uh, again, practices uh, uh, at the same time uh, applies to everybody, but when uh, each person is unique, and so that the way that the, the, the uh, uh, practice affects your particular constellation of a self and world uh, is what matters. Um, there's lots of ways to practice, so I would set aside the ones that are uh, distressing. If, as you do the attachment work and the attachment repair succeeds, then it may be that there's a, a more cohesive sense of self uh, that uh, is more resilient in, in uh, uh, rebounding uh, when you have the experiences of uh, not-self. Thank you. That helps. That makes sense. Good. Thanks, George. Thanks, Eve. You know, the um, Theravada practices affects one area of the brain. The Tibetan practices affects another. I'm not sure about the Zen practices. And um, the pronounced no-self experience is a, a Theravada feature. Uh, and that can be quite distressing to people. Um, also, the abrupt nature of the insights that tend to come from a Theravada practice are also disorienting to people. What I like to say is, uh, when you have, say, dissolution, which is the fifth stage, uh, or you have um, uh, um, Narota, um, which is later, uh, and you come back into the experience of self, uh, and world, if you've lived uh, your life and you've built the way that you operate on a lot of inauthenticity, you will find that you can't do the inauthenticity anymore. And this will be a huge disruption in terms of all of the relationships that you have. So that you can start now by being uh, as authentic as you can be and work through the distress and reestablish these uh, authentic experiences in relationship with people so that when you have the experiences of uh, 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 dissolution and you have the experience of fruition, uh, it won't be that big of a deal because everybody will already know who you are and the relationships will already be functioning. That's 
kind of how I think of it. I know that's, really that's, that's helpful too. Thank you. And, and I, I like it. I like it all. I was like, uh -huh. I'm not complaining about it, but I just, but, but I, I feel like I had to go through some steps <laughs> for it to be the right, for it to be, go the right, like go the right way. Right. So one of the things that often happens when you do uh, Vipassana is you have the insights that come from Vipassana. One is the solution, which dumps you into the knowledge of the miseries of the dark night. We sometimes call it, that's really the Christian version, but in uh, the knowledge of the miseries of of course, uh, you, you can't do inauthentic anymore. And so everything is a problem. Everything is a conflict. Everything has to be reorganized. Uh, and for and then uh, sometimes the prescription is to stop meditating and go in, into psychotherapy, which I've heard over and over from people. Uh, and uh, that doesn't really help either because you can't unsee, you know, when little Toto runs across uh, um, uh, and pulls the curtain back on the 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 snake oil sales when you can't see the terrifying odds anymore uh, so good thanks george uh -huh. eve i hope that was helpful <laughs> cool well we don't have any more questions oh so yeah steven did you want to ask a second question yeah, sure. Thank you. All right, and you go. Um, so the when you were talking about that, the one thing that came to mind is, and I've set an intention to practice this specifically. One of the transitions that I find is like not quick enough is going from equanimity to a meta state. Like specifically, uh, when I'm you know just so low. I live alone and most of the time alone and moving from just being in work mode to being into interaction with others. I find that transition is slow, like clunky often. And uh, my reactions to what you would, what you would expect to certain like interactions is like not, I look back at it later and I'm like, uh, like I definitely could have been more engaged there. And so I've specifically set an intention to work on transitioning between states more quickly. And I'm wondering if you specific, if you have practices that you know about like identifying the qualities of particular states so you can create those conditions quicker or things like that, but basically like shifting gears between them more quickly and easily. Any tips on that? Um, hmm. One of the things uh, that uh, uh, I studied for a while with Dan Brown, uh, who died recently, uh, who's a Tibetan practitioner in the Bon tradition, uh, and he would uh, talk about uh, lively awakened awareness uh, and monitoring uh, that. So in, 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 in uh, doing so, attempting to maintain the experience of lively awakened awareness at all times. So what you might uh, begin to pay attention to is what, uh, what view are you actually holding? And is it uh, really centered in the present moment or is it more thought oriented? A lot of the experience of being alone and out, outside of regular contact with other people is a auto-regulation uh, orientation where you're mainly in a thinking mode, uh, which pulls you out of the experience of the present moment into the mind. And then when you're uh, abruptly asked to come back into the present moment, you're caught up uh, in the internal state and it takes a while to recognize that actually you're not in the experience of present moment you're caught up in an auto-regulating thinking process uh, auto-regulating is usually past oriented or uh, future planning oriented and so and it's also tends to generate strong emotional states which uh, are hard to come out of so then you would want to uh, over and over again during the, the course of the, the day uh, track present moment experience and see if you can distinguish it from uh, thinking 
more and then try and orient yourself toward um, present moment experience. Understand that social isolation for human beings is in, a, in and of itself painful. We're not oriented toward that. I know that in affluent uh, uh, societies like ours, where we can actually afford isolation um, in a way that uh, uh, places that aren't as affluent can't, uh, we tend to value that uh, privacy and that, that alone space. But biologically, it causes distress, which builds over time and can get to a fairly high level of pain. And if you're used to it, you, you don't notice that you're running at a fairly high level of pain, which requires a lot of regulation. So then what you would want to begin to do is understand that really uh, you need to be in proximity to uh, people that you enjoy. Let's call it uh, a minimum of two hours a day for the, 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 the whole biological system to be in balance. And what, how big is your deficit in terms of socializing if you were to use that as the minimum? and then begin to orient yourself toward needing to be in physical proximity to somebody who's emotionally regulating. So always in, in relationship to other people, you want to track, do I feel better just hanging out without doing anything in particular? Do I feel the same or do I feel worse? And begin to map who you know that you feel better with and then try to organize it in such a way that you can spend a, a, a minimum of two hours a day with people that are in the category of regulating or making me feel better. And I think that that would, um, it can be that you get into such a, a high level of discomfort from just being socially isolated that you almost have to get yourself into a trance state in order to tolerate that level of pain and then to come out of that trance state and come back into the present moment um, is going to take a transition you know, we're biochemical, uh, you know, the liver has to get involved in this. The, uh, additional chemicals have to get involved in, in changing that experience. Whereas if you orient, a, orient yourself to being in the present moment, you don't need to, to come out in that sense. Is that helpful? Yeah, definitely. That gives me a lot to think about. I definitely notice how the longer stretch of time without interaction, usually the more difficult switching states. Right. And um, yeah, that's definitely interesting to think about like as a baseline, the amount of socialization. And I mean, if I do more of those transitions to socialization, there's the practice right there, every transition. So right. that's super helpful. Thank you. Good. And while you're doing it, be perfectly authentic. I'll try. <laughs> Thank you, Stephen. Thanks, George. Uh -huh. um, Noah, would you like to ask your question? So the sort of part of the question is like, like what's the best way to approach executive functioning problems. So problems with the goal-directed behavior. So would that be like focusing more on the attachment repair? I'm wondering if like, I've done some attachment repair work and it has seemed to have improved that. Um, but my insight practice is kind of well-developed and I kind of want to keep going there, but um, you kind of, you have my number in terms of like, <laughs> like right now, the thing that's like impacting my ability to practice is like the fact that my job takes too long because I can't focus during my work day. So um, I just wonder if you have any thoughts or like, if you can like help, if you have experience with people having dramatic improvements in executive function doing attachment repair work or whatever you would recommend. Well, um, there are people um, that think that, uh, um, one of the, the symptoms of attach, an attachment disturbance is the attention issues that, that come up for people. Um, and so that when you uh, um, do the attachment work, um, the attention doesn't need to scatter because of the way that you create 
the perception of self and world. Um, you know, we have these working models of self, we have these working models of the world, we see ourselves in a particular way, we have expectations of what the world might provide for us. Uh, and uh, if they're painful and the mind wanders into them, it can shatter uh, our concentration as a way of emotionally regulating the, that experience. So that when you work through those experiences so that they're no longer painful or uh, you don't need to get away from them, uh, then it doesn't uh, interrupt your uh, um, concentration. Uh, another um, uh, area to explore is how do you emotionally regulate? Most people emotionally regulate through thinking. Uh, so, and we mostly use the strategies that we learn in childhood in our family systems for emotional regulation. So how well does your family system regulate emotions? How well uh, did they instruct you in what emotions were and how to address them? Did they uh, help you build a, uh, a capacity for really intense emotional experiences without needing to, to regulate? All of those things you can uh, adjust. But what you may notice uh, if, you're, uh, if you have low threshold for emotional intensity and that something happens emotionally that, that you then need to think about in order to regulate, you're moving from the, the present moment experience that causes the emotional dysregulation into, into the thinking strategy, which interrupts the attention. So there's lots of uh, ways to, to look at that. One of the things about doing the, we do a th three pillar approach in attachment repair, ideal parent figure, which is remapping the early childhood experiences, but, uh, uh, particularly the difficult ones, particularly the trauma. And then we use Vipassana, the meta Vipassana approach to train um, beneficial emotional regulation strategies so that you can abandon using the afflictive emotional regulation strategies so you don't consume so much energy. An example from my own life is I, I go to the gym uh, two or three times a week and in the workout that used to take me an hour to do now takes me a half hour to do because I'm not using all these afflictive emotional regulation strategies like I hate this, this sucks, this is the worst thing, why am I here? I can't believe how heavy this is, this is uncomfortable, all of those things I have replaced with, I can totally do this. And uh, so you do need to examine how you regulate your experience. Uh, you need to look at the aspect of exploration and, and what your expectation is. If you're doing a task and you're getting close to finishing the task, but you're worried that the task is going to be rejected or that there's going to be a problem with it, because that's your experience of things, you'll delay finishing the task as long as you can, because not because you don't want to finish the task, but because you're trying to delay the afflictive emotional experience that you're going to have in, as a result of finishing the task, which is based on not the reality of finishing the task, but on your expectation of how the world will respond to you. If you can't track that, uh, they conflate and you have created a conceptual reality where it doesn't matter how well you do on finishing the task, it's always going to be rejected. So there's lots of ways to, to get into it, but I would uh, we do a, a, an ideal parent figure protocol for the remapping so that you can uh, change your expectation to where you're expecting positive results. We do the Vipass meta Vipassana on remapping uh, the emotional regulation strategies. And then we teach uh, the nature of collaborative relationships. People who grow up in family systems where, where that isn't taught often accept uh, relationship terms that are painful. And so uh, the difficulty in relationship can be the thing that keeps dragging attention out of the present moment because it's painful and needs to be regulated. Um, one of the things about these kinds of questions is they're extremely complex <laughs> and hard to answer in a few sentences. Is that helpful? Yes, thank you. Did I answer your question? Yeah, I mean, John, I do have a bit of a follow-up. I don't know if there's time. If there's another person on the queue. Um, if you keep it quick, because there are a couple more questions, but feel free. He asked you. Go, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, you kind of went through a lot. I, I, I've done like a lot of that stuff, and I see now 
like I'm thinking reflecting on what's like actually distracting me lately. Yeah. And it's, I have to read these um, legal opinions about people who are suffering. And I go and I have to know like what happened to these people and like they're like rotting in jail and I feel guilty. And so like, what would be like your go-to like for that to, to just stay focused on my job and not get pulled away by that, by feeling compassion? <laughs> um, uh, well, I would probably flip it into, I'm, I can be super helpful here. So okay. I'm aiming back at the work, right? Mm -hmm. If I do this, I can be super helpful. So I'm, I'm overwhelmed by the, the level of suffering. I'm going to slip into a sympathetic response rather than into a compassionate response. Can anyway, because they're not there. But um, understanding the actual language that the mind is using to regulate itself and rewrite it, and then insist that the mind use the edited version that actually uh, pushes you into doing more rather than pulling you out into sadness and then separating the sadness that the, the current thought is from what's probably your own emotional reserves of sadness that get activated. Thank you. That's super helpful. Good. Thanks, Noah. And thank you, George. Stop right here. As someone with some executive dysfunction issues myself, I really appreciated that uh, discussion. So thank you. Uh, Philip, would you like to ask your question? <clears throat> uh, in terms of talking about authenticity, what I've kind of noticed for myself, I don't know if you agree with this, is that if like I'm in say a grumpy mood, I, I feel like I connect with peop people better if I don't try to create like, um, a persona of like loving kindness, even though I know that's kind of like the correct worldview to have to always feel loving kindness or not have anger or stuff like that. So like, let's say I, I'm not incredibly excited to see someone, even if it's a friend, I'll, <laughs> I always say like hello to them. But if I am, then I'll reflect that in like a more loving uh, tone or something. Um, so like, but that's at least how I feel about that. I feel like I connect better with people if I'm kind of congruent with my feelings in that way but would would you say that you you should take that further to like if you're experiencing anger to express that anger and be authentic in that way because like you know i know intellectually that anger comes from uh negative emotional states or mind states whatever like a, a, a version that you should get rid of um but maybe it, it's still um the it's still the best for everyone to just express that and somehow that'll like uh, help you work through it in the long term so you have an agreement in terms of the intimacy level of your relationship with everybody whether it's implicit or explicit i tend to prefer explicit agreements so it's quite clear uh, what level of expression is uh, in keeping with the agreement of the relationship you don't get into trouble if you keep the agreement of the relationship, you get into trouble in relationships if you don't keep the agreement. So if you have a, an intimate relationship where the agreement is that you're going to express everything and you withhold the experience of anger, you're violating the agreement. And that's actually going to get you into more trouble than expressing the anger. So part of this is being clear uh, about what is the nature of the agreement in the relationship that I'm in, and am I maintaining that uh, agreement in my expressions? Now, you may have a relationship where all of that internal process and all of the variation of your mood is not part of the agreement of the relationship. And then in that relationship, you get into trouble for expressing it, not for withholding it. So part of this is really having a good idea of what is the nature of the relationship you have. For instance, in personal intimate relationships, there's a lot of expressions that are expected and you would get into trouble for withholding them. But those same expressions would get you in trouble in a work relationship where you don't have that agreement where those things are supposed to be expressed. What you're supposed to be expressing in the work relationship is the role that you've agreed to fulfill in the business and not a lot else. So it's really uh, developing a sense of clarity uh, but I also think that this is part of the authenticity piece is making these these um, these elections explicit. So 
both people understand what what the expectation in the relationship is. Uh, we can often get into a place where we're frightened about uh, expressing intimacy in the relationship, and then that tends to uh, move us in the direction of withholding. Um, but um, for somebody who is, the expectation is that you'll tell them everything that you, if you will hold something, uh, the problem is not that you didn't, that you didn't tell them, not that you expressed something. Uh, making sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Um, that's the third pillar, what we, we teach the nature of intimate relationships and also how to structure intimate and non-intimate relationships so that, it, that it's really clear. You don't want to uh, volunteer uh, intimate experiences to somebody that hasn't already proved themselves trustworthy because if you do, you'll feel vulnerable and threatened. Uh, you want to very slowly move into these places of high trust and high security in relationships, which is what secure people just do out of the box, whereas insecure people have a tendency to rush in way too fast, um, make too many commitments too fast and not be able to sustain them uh, and uh, creates this perception that people are unreliable. Unreliable people are unreliable and reliable people are reliable. And so you have to be able to tell them apart and then move, uh, um, make yourself reliable, which opens the door to reliable people and then form relationships with people who are reliable because then they'll want to know all of those things and they'll want to be helpful to you. Okay. Yeah. I'll <laughs> thank you. Thanks. Good. Thanks, Philip. Thank you, George. Mm -hmm. Paul. Would you like to ask your question? Uh, yes, hi. Uh, so uh, I, it was interesting what you said about, uh, you know, uh, being in the presence of someone that you feel comfortable with for um, at least two hours a day in, the, in their physical presence, you know, that makes a lot of sense. But uh, when there are situations where that's not, possible on a daily basis. So uh, what other avenues are there um, to supplement or fill in when, when that's not possible? Well, what I would uh, suggest is that you begin to organize your life in such a way that it's, it's routinely possible mm. uh, and that that where the, where the effort would be rather than uh, uh, moving toward a, uh, an alternative strategy. Really, as in, in a human body, we are set up to be in relationship to other people. And our whole nervous system, our, our whole being is actually organized at a biological level to be in proximity to other people. So the idea then is to organize your life in such a way where that's possible if you can. Well, uh, oh, okay, but um, so you're, I'm, are you distinguishing between being around people um, versus, you know, um, so when you're saying this two hours at minimum, are you including just people that you associate with? Um, it's not necessarily a close relationship. I am. You? Okay. So, so you, what you want to do is pay attention do you feel better? Do you feel the same or do you feel worse? And just map the people that you routinely encounter and then organize in such a way that you, you're, you're spending that two hours with people that make you feel better. The emotional regulation um, that happens between people is automatic and unconscious. So you don't see the processes that are happening. You just see the outcome of it. Now it could be, uh, it doesn't have to be an intimate relationship where that happens, just somebody who makes you feel better. Now, uh, also understand that they have the same experience. You could make them feel better. You could make them feel the same. You could make them feel worse. Somebody who makes you feel better, you could actually make feel worse. So you then have to uh, organize it so that you're spending time with people who feel better spending time with you that you also feel better feeling uh, uh, from hanging out with them. But it doesn't have to be an intimate relationship. Work relationships work just as well. I mean, 
you know, um, men talk about sports uh, more than women do, but the sports conversations are these regulating conversations that they're having. That's why they have them. Uh, but it, it may not be intimate beyond uh, uh, the, the shared uh, interest of the game, right? Um, whatever it is that is that uh, uh, thing that gets you to spend the time together. All right, thanks for clarifying that. That makes a lot of sense. Good. Thank you, Paul. And thank you, George. So um, we are at the end. Um, we're almost at the hour mark. So I want to, uh, of course, thank George. George, thank you so much mm -hmm. uh, for spending this time with us. Um, thanks for all your advice and instruction and teaching. Any final stuff you want to say before we wrap? Nope. Enjoy your practice. I had a feeling. <laughs> you might not. Um, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, everyone, for your time, for your attention, for your questions, for your practice. See you all soon. Have a good night. Bye.